Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcome to the panel uh, on queer migrations for women in Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. My name is Alexandra Nikoskaya. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Russian Studies Workshop at the Russian and East European Institute here at Indiana University, Bloomington. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, but I accept any, all other pronouns too, if you wish. Um, and I am the host uh, of today's panel. So, uh, and uh, so yes, welcome everyone again. I'm so glad you all uh, could join us. So uh, before, uh, before I introduce the panelists, I also have a, well, I have a very short agenda here. I wanted to say a few words about, uh, about uh, our, our institute's stand uh, in support of Ukraine in Russia's war against Ukraine. And also I, I wanted to do a very short, very quick land acknowledgement and then talk about the matters here. So speaking of, the, uh, of, our, uh, of our support uh, for Ukraine, uh, it is. It might be. Uh, it might be common sense uh, and uh, commonplace by now, uh, by this time. But it's still. I think it's important to just spell out that uh, we faculty, students, staff, and other affiliates at the Robert F. Burns Russian East European Institute, uh, the Russian Studies Workshop, the Austrian Workshop, the Center for Refugee Studies, the Ukrainian Studies Organization, and other international institutes and programs at Indiana University condemn in the strongest terms, the Russian military attack on the state of Ukraine. We express our deep concern for the safety and welfare of the Ukrainian people and call on international agencies and surrounding countries uh, to ensure the welfare of Ukrainians within the country. The unprovoked, unjustified uh, attack on the independent state by uh, the Russian Federation is an affront uh, to international law and jeopardizes the post-World uh, War II international order. We uphold Ukraine's sovereignty and its right to choose its own alliances and call on Russia and the EU to respect the rights of non combatant citizens. And also since uh, Indiana University uh, is a land grant institution with, which has its own problematic history that I don't have much time to go into now, I want to acknowledge that uh, the university is located on indigenous homelands of the Miami, Delaware, Kota Watomi and Shoni, who are, have been, and will always be the uh, real owners of these lands. So thank you for being for uh, joining me in uh, these two important statements. Now, let's talk about more important things. So today's panel uh, brings together scholars of queer migrations from uh, and within and from Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And I will, I will introduce each speaker in the order listed on the promotional flyer just before their presentation. They will, uh, each uh, speaker will have five, eight, well, 15 to 20 minutes to introduce their work. Uh, so and I will moderate uh, the discussion that will follow. I have prepared a few questions that I will uh, ask all speakers to address if they wish, and also we'll open the uh, discussion to the Q&A from, uh, from the audience afterwards. Um, I wanted to say, <laughs> but also, so I wanted uh, just a few words about my, my own connection to the field uh, of queer migrations. I have been researching uh, queer migrations from countries often understood as post-Soviet, right? That is having the shared legacy of once being part of the Soviet Union. Um, and the queer communities, queer immigrant communities that have formed in the wake of this migration in the United States and particularly in New York City. Uh, this is what I did my uh, dissertation research on. I worked with asylum seekers who have been prime, well, the, really the majority of these migrants, but also uh, other older generation uh, queer migrants and immigrants living who have been living in New York and the United States sometimes for decades uh, having come and in, in the late 80s or even uh, 90s or even earlier uh, as part of a different wave of migration from then even the Soviet Union. And in the course of my research, I have, I have personally struggled with terms and concepts which, with how to define, how to understand and how, what would, uh, how to find a term that would be the least, uh, really the least politically, ideologically loaded and yet we could also encompass the greatest diversity of the people that I've met during my work. 
initially they are uh, uh, well, I come on a, con uh, a scholarly convention maybe some 10 years ago when I was getting started was to refer to these incredibly diverse people as Russian speaking migrants. Because again, of the, uh, of the legacies uh, of Russian as a lingua franca for not just in Russia, but uh, really in, in, in many places in the world where uh, people with uh, roots in that Eurasian so, well, Soviet and post-Soviet region were coming from, uh, which reflected the reality on the ground. But at the same time, it was also problematic because of, uh, well, because most, I think myself included and other scholars did not necessarily think much about, about the colonial undertones of uh, referring to people who are not Russian by citizenship or nationality as Russian people. Uh, so post-Soviet was another term that, uh, had a circulation at the time and still does and uh, seemed perhaps less uh, laden again at the time because at least it did not have this Russian speaking like, <laughs> this, this stamp right in the middle of it. Well, uh, rather, rather referring to political histories, right? Uh, again, uh, and if we talk about queer migrations, uh, the incredibly diverse people that myself and other scholars have worked with have written about in, in most cases have to negotiate, have had to negotiate the Soviet legacies of homo and transphobia, of silence around sexuality, about gender nonconformity of any kind. So it wouldn't be, again, wrong to, to use this term, at, and at least at the time it seemed okay. And then of course, everything changed last year when Russia attacked Ukraine uh, in a full scale way. And, uh, and uh, as uh, everywhere in area studies, uh, scholars of migration from the region, including queer migration, now have to deal with the, well, with the new, with finding new ways to refer to, uh, to understand, to, to define and describe the, what they study. I hope to hear from everyone today, from our dear panelists here, but also from people in the audience, if they have some ideas of what terms we could use. As you, as you can see from the title of today's panel, we decided just to settle on geography. And to uh, um, uh, so that's how we have that's how we ended up having Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia in the title of the panel as the regions, uh, queer migrants that we have well that the panelists have worked with either have originated from or might be moving to right and from and within these regions. Yet at the same time. It also needs to be absolutely stated plainly that none of us does research on Central Asia specifically, uh, and, and we all are racialized as white people, while most people living in Central Asia are racialized as ethnically other, both in the region and obviously in the West. So it is a problem too. And I, sadly, again, I do not have an absolute like, easy uh, solution here, but I do want to uh, bring to your attention one one piece of scholarship that was brought to my attention a few days ago by Yana Sitnikova, who is also a scholar of gender and sexuality and migration in, in the region. And her, uh, and unfortunately she couldn't join us today, but she told me about a presentation she made not so long ago, and, post, and also which is available on her, um, on her academia.edu profile, uh, a presentation of, uh, about her own research on uh, queer migrants from Central Asia in Russia. Uh, and so I will just put the link in the chat. So if anyone would like to see it, um, uh, you're welcome to. And this is the probably <laughs> probably so, so little bordering on insignificant, but the thing I, I thought of doing uh, to address this imbalance of uh, power imbalance and representation imbalance, even in the evident in the title of our panel that we have Central Asia here. And I know that uh, panelists will talk about uh, migrants from Central Asia uh, that they uh, have worked with, but at the same time, we are not Central Asians here. We, so do not want to appropriate anybody else's, uh, uh, anybody else's uh, identities and subjectivities and voices. Well, with that, <laughs> with that, I would like to continue on and to introduce first Dr. Richard Moll as the first speaker. Uh, who is a professor of so political sociology at the School of Slavonic and East uh, European Studies at UCL. His research focuses uh, on the relationship between identity and power, 
with particular reference to nationalism, sexualities, and migration. He is the editor of Queer Migration and Asylum in Europe, which can be downloaded for free of charge from uh, the UCL Press website. And yet again, I'm going to post the link in the chat. For everyone interested, I have this book. It's amazing. And so, uh, Dr. Moll, please take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just give me a second to share my screen. There we go. Uh, so thank you very much. And um, now the, the presentation I'm giving today is actually based on uh, a project that I, I finished quite a, a while ago now. I started doing the project in 2011. Um, although there were subsequent waves of interviews which sort of continued for a few years after that. Um, so the, the, most of the migrants that I spoke to uh, moved to Berlin before the, the gay propaganda law um, and certainly well before the, uh, the annexation of Crimea and the, um, sorry it's my cat's tail, um, and the um, uh, invasion, uh, full-scale invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia. Um, so while it's quite an old project, I, I think nevertheless it's sort of useful um, to at least see uh, the, the significant changes uh, that have um, undergone uh, in the past uh, sort of 10 years um, and will sort of provide a sort of a, perhaps a sort of a springboard uh, for the discussion that um, uh, Masha and uh, Marina will uh, engage in later on. Um, so just a sort of a little bit about the background. So the, the presentation is part of a larger project I did on queer Poles, Russians and Brazilians in London and Berlin. Um, and it was based on uh, interview data um, and also participant uh, observation. Um, and there was a, a quantitative arm of about uh, 800 uh, questionnaires. Um, and so they were the sort of the general uh, themes I was sort of interested in um, looking at those three uh, national communities. Um, so against this backdrop, uh, the aim of my current presentation uh, is to examine migration by queer individuals from Russia and other post-Soviet states to Berlin, uh, with a view to exploring their motivations for migrating, their choice of destination, their integration strategies, and their relations with the Russian-speaking ethno-cultural diaspora, and assessing the extent to which each of these processes was and is influenced by sexuality. So, as we all know, um, homosexuality um, uh, between men was decriminalized by the, the Russian Duma in 1993, and attitudes towards the LGBT community did slowly improve throughout the 90s um, and the early years of Putin's rule. Um, but this sort of changed um, in the early 2010s, um, following the mass protests against the perceived falsification of the, the parliamentary elections, which prompted Putin to reaffirm his political legitimacy by protecting traditional Russian values uh, in the face of alien ideas from the West, such as uh, tolerance of homosexuality. As we know, this resulted in the uh, federal law banning the spreading of propaganda of non traditional sexual relations, after which uh, attitudes towards homosexuality deteriorated. So the increasingly hostile atmosphere for non-heterosexuals prompted many homosexuals, outside of activist circles at least, uh, to retreat to the private sphere or to gays and gay and lesbian bars and clubs, which offered relatively safe spaces. Uh, in general, what emerged from the data was that the ability to live one's life in Russia without fear of discrimination or physical violence largely depended on one's ability to pass as heterosexual. Um, so as we can see with uh, Boris, um, he was not out uh, while living in Russia. Uh, only very few people um, knew that she was gay. Uh, my colleagues didn't know I was gay. My parents didn't know I was gay. My straight friends didn't know I was gay. Uh, but I don't look gay by Russian standards, so it wasn't a problem. Um, but this wasn't the, the, the case for uh, everybody that I spoke to. Um, Alyosha, for example, said, you know, I never told anybody I was gay. I never came out. But you can tell I'm gay. I can't hide it. It's my nature. What am I supposed to do? So one could argue that um, for queers who did not wish to remain invisible in the public sphere or who felt unable to remain invisible, um, even if they wanted to, the basic response was one of either exit or voice to use Hirschman's classic paradigm, i.e. either to protest uh, or to leave. Um, and obviously sort of one of the, the options that I sort of focus on particularly uh, was the, the exit uh, strategy, namely sort of migration. 
uh, to quote John Binney, how migration was used as a means of escape, but also uh, one of self-realization. Uh, now, while the Western media, certainly sort of the British media, often gave the impression that gays and lesbians in the in liberal East, so to speak, were forced to migrate to the liberal West due to the intolerance towards homosexuality in the home societies, the picture painted by my respondents was far more complex. While sexuality did play a role in the migration decisions of almost all of my respondents, it was not always the primary motivating factor. Indeed, migration was not the preferred option for everyone, and migration was not always expected to be permanent, even among those who did move to Berlin for reasons relating to their sexuality. Uh, what did uh, become clear, though, was that very often it may not have been the reason for them to move to Berlin, uh, but it was very often the reason for them not to move back uh, to their, their original homelands. So in choosing the destination, um, I wanted to sort of understand why they chose Germany, first of all, um, and then why Berlin in particular. Uh, and there were a number of reasons why they would choose Germany. Um, so first of all, there was a large population of German Russians, um, so descendants of Germans who had moved to Russia uh, under the, the reign of uh, Catherine the Great, um, and who could trace their ancestry back to Germany. Um, and because of that, they would have preferential visa treatment. Uh, similarly, Russian Jews um, could also uh, sort of use beneficial uh, sort of preferential uh, visa treatment. Uh, everybody else uh, would have to get a visa and either use their sort of uh, cultural capital to uh, sort of enroll at university uh, or their economic capital to get a job. Um, and it was sort of clear from the, the quantitative research that the, uh, the, the Russian speaking migrants in Berlin were a very sort of uh, well-educated uh, group. Over 80% of them had at least a BA degree. Um, when I asked them why they chose Berlin, um, partly it was their reputation, uh, the, the city's reputation as an open, creative and affordable city. Um, in 2011, it was affordable, less affordable nowadays. Um, but it was also the, the specific character uh, of Berlin. Um, uh, if anybody, sort of, if you know Berlin, if you ever walk Karl, down Karl Marx Allee, uh, you could pretty much be anywhere in Eastern Europe. There's a sort of an architecture and a vibe uh, that has a very sort of East European post-communist stamp to it. Um, and so this was something that sort of appealed to Masha, for example. Um, Zoya, she moved um, from Russia to Western Europe with her German girlfriend um, and always sort of felt rather sort of split between Eastern and Western Europe, which was why she particularly liked uh, Berlin. Um, so she said it's the unique character of this city. It was divided between East and West and then joined together. I like that. Growing up in Russia and then moving to Western Europe, there was this huge rift uh, between these two worlds. And in Berlin, I found, I've been found somehow been able to bring these two worlds together so that they're no longer in opposition. Now, when I sort of asked about their motivations, um, a lot of the academic literature would argue that um, the, there are sort of some three key reasons uh, that sort of individuals will migrate. A lot of the work by uh, Andrew Gorman Murray, for example, uh, sort of focuses on uh, motivations. Uh, and the first would be coming out migration. Those who didn't feel able to come out um, in their home countries uh, would uh, sort of move abroad and therefore they could felt sort of more comfortable coming out without necessarily their families finding out. And um, so that was the case for Ivan. Um, he said, my family is very important to me, so I didn't feel that I could come out while I was living in Russia. That wasn't possible. So it was only after I moved to Cologne that I started to live for myself, that I started to live. Uh, the second motivation is known as gravitational group migration. And this is when you move to a, a city or a part of the city uh, where there is a sort of an LGBT presence. So there's a sense of community, or at least there are sort of bars and clubs. Um, and again, this was sort of what Boris, uh, what drew Boris um, to Berlin. Um, so he said, you know, I, um, you know, I, I earned a lot. He earned a lot when he was uh, sort of working in Russia. He traveled a lot and he saw how people lived and how other people, uh, how other societies treated gay people. Therefore, I set myself the goal of living in a city, in a country where you don't have to hide your orientation. You don't have to be afraid of everything and where you can be who you want to be. So that was why I moved here. Um, other less common motivations were sort of relationship migration, um, such as Zoya, who moved uh, to be with her partner, 
Um, and something that wasn't actually discussed by um, Gorman Murray, but was something that sort of came up in my uh, interviews was sexual citizenship rights, uh, particularly for individuals who were interested in adopting um, or for um, sort of entering in a, a, a same sex partnership. Uh, but what sort of also became clear was that the um, that the uh, communities of belonging that the queer migrants were seeking out in Berlin were not defined exclusively in terms of sexual orientation. Uh, while they very much sort of appreciated sort of the, uh, the gay clubs and bars, uh, the gay scene of Berlin, um, there was a sort of other sort of um, uh, communities of belonging that were also important to them, and particularly with reference to their Russianness. Um, so Russianness or the, the, the desire to sort of maintain a Russian identity, uh, to uh, engage with Russian culture, to speak the Russian language, uh, was something that was sort of considered to be important for almost all of my um, respondents. Um, and it was a sort of language in particular that was sort of considered to be particularly important. Partly it was sort of instrumental that they were initially unable to speak German fluently. Uh, it was sort of much easier just to sort of speak Russian. They could speak in a more sophisticated manner in Russian rather than in German. I and mean, then also there were sort of cultural references and cultural meanings. They could um, sort of share anecdotes about uh, Russia without necessarily having to sort of uh, explain the, the sort of the cultural inferences. Um, and then a number of people referred to sort of Russian mentality, this idea of Russian mentality. Um, they some of, some of them found sort of Germans not as sort of warm-hearted as Russians. Um, you know, they they recognised this was perhaps stereotypical, but nevertheless, they just sort of liked being around other Russians. Um, and this is sort of quite common for sort of migrants, not just sort of queer migrants. Uh, very often, you will sort of seek out a pre-existing diaspora community as a way to maintain your sort of sense of identity, but also for sort of social, political, uh, economic, and psychological support. And um, what previous research has shown, however, is that diasporic spaces are not necessarily very welcoming for uh, LGBT migrants. Um, very often, um, the, the traditional ethno, uh, ethno national diaspora is very often sort of as traditional, if not more traditional, than the, the culture that was left behind, and particularly with regard to uh, sort of gender and sexuality. Um, also, a lot of uh, culture, um, diasporic uh, cultures are sort of built around uh, the church, uh, Saturday schools, um, cultural centers, which are either sort of unavailable um, to the, the queer migrants or were not considered particularly uh, welcoming. Um, and so this was sort of the case I found when I asked them whether they sort of engaged with the traditional uh, Russian diaspora in Berlin, which was sort of very large. And um, so Vladimir, for example, said, well, he didn't go to traditional boyfriends where there were only Russians, uh, sorry, to traditional restaurants with his boyfriend where there were only Russians, uh, because he said that, they, that he sort of felt uncomfortable. He didn't feel that like he could sort of be himself. Um, and there were also um, sort of Russia days um, where the, the Russian community would sort of come together. Um, and again, Boris um, said that the, that really didn't appeal. Um, he said, it reminds me of the Russia I left behind, drunk uncivilized people swearing. This is exactly what I wanted to escape from. So even if um, sort of the, the Russian queer migrants didn't want to engage with the um, diaspora as a social form, in the sense of you know, groups of, of Russians, uh, they would still sort of be interested in diaspora as a form of consciousness. So they identified with, with Russian culture and were sort of keen to engage with different forms of Russian culture. Uh, but again, Daria, for example, sort of found that the it, that it was only really very traditional understandings of what Russian culture was uh, that you could sort of find um, supported by the, the Russian community. Um, so, for example, you know, she said that, you know, what the embassy and the, the House of Russian Culture do is absolute. This is what authentic culture is. Um, it's true there are Goethe institutes in other countries and they propagate German culture, but it's not just Goethe and Schiller, it's much more, it's much more varied. Um, so she was sort of looking for sort of more alternative, contemporary, uh, queer forms of Russian culture, which the traditional diaspora was not providing. And so what um, sort of came um, about through the, uh, came to the fore in the interviews, um, and something that was also true of uh, other sort of LGBT diasporas, it was that they would risk being doubly marginalized. Um, so they didn't necessarily feel very welcome um, as ethnic minorities within German society, but at the same time, they didn't feel welcome among the Russian 
uh, diaspora community in Berlin. Um, and so it was sort of these concerns that led to the creation of Quartira. Um, so Quartira, for those of you who speak uh, Russian, um, is the Russian word for apartment, uh, but it was chosen because it's made up of the words queer and art. Um, and a lot of the, the queer Russians who sort of set up Quartira uh, were engaged in artistic uh, practice. So the aims of Quartira are to act as an organization to represent the interests of Russian speaking gays and lesbians in Berlin, to counteract the homophobia in the Russian ethnocultural diaspora, to provide a space to discuss personal problems relating to sexuality, to protest against the homophobic policies of the Russian government, and to support LGBT activists in Russia. Now, in this sense, it could be understood simply as a, a social movement. Um, but if we are to understand the effective appeal of Quartira to its members, the role it plays as a specifically Russian space, the social and psychological support it offers its members, the desire of its members to change the socio-political situation in Russia, and the sense of solidarity they feel towards queer people in the homeland, I argue that we uh, should really understand Quartira as a form of queer diaspora. Um, so thank you. These were just some sort of uh, introductory uh, remarks, but I look forward to discussing them further with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moll. Um, okay, so I am going to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Marina Shevtsova, who is a visiting scholar at Pompeo Fabra University, Barcelona, and also a Utopia postdoctoral scholar and guest professor at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. She works on LGBTQ activism and anti-gender movements in Central and Eastern Europe, particularly in Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. She is currently working on an edited volume, Feminist Perspectives on Russia's War in Ukraine, Here Are Voices, that will be published with Lexington Books later this year. And uh, she has just published uh, an, uh, an article about the experiences of the Ukrainian, well, queer Ukrainian war refugees, uh, which uh, is, well, I. <laughs> which is such an important work. So thank you so much, Dr. Shevtsova, for doing it. And please take it away. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alexandra, for organizing this and for inviting me. Uh, I will also share my screen just now. Okay, here it is. And I will time myself. Okay. Um, so uh, unlike uh, Richard's piece, this is a project in the making. So um, it will not be uh, yet much loaded theoretically. Uh, I just finished the, the field work and uh, I have here a slide to, uh, to tell you a little bit about the research I'm presenting or parts of it that I'm presenting today. So this is a qualitative study, uh, which is a part of uh, uh, two larger projects. And one of them is my side project. Uh, so until the large scale invasion, uh, I've been like, I, I worked a little bit on uh, queer migration from Ukraine. And uh, my, my uh, respondents or my sampling was quite uh, one sided, I have to admit. So I conducted uh, several dozens of interviews with Ukrainian but uh, uh, queer refugees, but all of them were actually uh, cisgender gay men. And uh, they were, and I divided them into groups. So half of them were those who left uh, before Euromaidan, before 2013-14, and the others were those who were living later. Um, and uh, I was like slowly thinking what, what to do with that, with that uh, information, because somehow it didn't really, I couldn't find a good theory or um yeah got uh, all, and also good time to to work with with the data and then uh, 24th uh, of february happened and uh, i got uh, an invitation to join a project uh, supported by two organizations by uh, the voice and flex foundation and also organized by gender stream nipro based uh, ukrainian lgbtq rights organization and the their request was to do a qualitative study on uh, challenges needs problems of ukrainian lgbtq uh, people who left Ukraine after February 24th. And we agreed that I could also use those materials for, for, larger, for larger study, for, for an academic publication, for a book, uh, where I would like to, to combine that analysis of those two cohorts or waves of migration that are, of course, quite different. And today I will be speaking only about the ones uh, who, or those who left um, uh, last year or uh, this year after the large-scale invasion. 
the interviews took place from December last year until until last week. Last week, I conducted last interviews uh, in, in Berlin. And uh, the countries that we covered were uh, Austria, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Germany, Italy, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia. Uh, so 40 participants so we had uh, of uh, the age varied from 19 to 42 year old and um, we tried to be as diverse as possible with regard to their gender identity, their sexual orientation and uh, uh, their identity um, as such. As the only uh, condition was that uh, they were supposed to have Ukrainian citizenship and uh, to leave Ukraine, have left Ukraine after February 24th, so uh, as a consequence of the large-scale invasion. Mm. Now some findings that I would like to introduce today, even though now I have uh, more and more questions and answers, I still have to go through all the texts and all, all materials. And first, of course, are related to the decision to leave. Uh, and this is, uh, for example, quite interesting as compared to, to previous presentation. Uh, and with my first cohort of uh, people I worked with, because the people I interviewed this time, most of them, except maybe uh, one or two persons, uh, were not planning to leave Ukraine uh, until um, until Russian, Russian large-scale invasion. And also, interestingly, uh, you probably all know more or less what the situation with LGBTQ rights was in Ukraine, even though, of course, uh, the... Um, uh, homosexuality was uh, homosexual relationships between men were decriminalized in 1991 even though we had increased visibility uh, and uh, marches of equality in many cities already in the recent years still of course the legislation wasn't uh, good uh, we only have one had one law that was protecting lgbtq people from discrimination not really implemented uh, there was uh, there, there remains homo and transphobic crime and hate speech Still, for uh, all those people, um, they actually commented that they were quite open about their sexuality, about their gender identity, not always supported by their families, but they had uh, quite a supportive circle of friends or colleagues or both. And even though some of them had to leave semi-closeted, especially the couples with kids, so uh, some, um, some of them had to... Uh, keep it low for schools and for other administrative procedures still they were all saying that their life was comfortable the way it was in a sense that even if they had to be semi-closeted they didn't consider leaving because their material situation was very good they ran some businesses uh, they had some activist circles where their kids also could see that they have uh, friends like themselves and so for them the question to to leave the country where they don't speak the language where the uh, job situation won't be ideal or uh, will be no employment for them, it wasn't an option. So for all of them, of course, it was extremely uh, stressful experience. Many of them uh, decided to leave almost immediately, either because of children. That was one of the reasons also, like not really related to sexuality uh, or gender identity. For others, it was, of course, related to, to this because uh, there was from the very beginning, that was, so there was, of course, the, the reputation of uh, the uh, Russian state as a very homophobic, but also there was information about uh, the active human rights activists and especially LGBTQ activists uh, who would be persecuted about the lists uh, or the information that could be found online. So many people collected, uh, like took their uh, things and left immediately. This is, of course, uh, with, with asterisks, I have to make a note that also many LGBTQ people made a conscious decision to stay and uh, either to join military forces, to volunteer, or just continue working and uh, their resistance. And then, of course, uh, another uh, issue to, to mention is that not everybody was allowed to leave. And this also shaped partially my sampling because uh, the you know that in Ukraine, uh, during the uh, al almost immediately, the ban was um, introduced for men uh, from 18 to 60 year old to leave the country, except they had some uh, special circumstances, which meant that for uh, many uh, cisgender gay men and also for uh, trans women who didn't have uh, their documents changed and still had the M male gender market, marker, it was quite a challenge or impossible to, to leave the country. So for trans people, uh, it was possible after certain procedures, after getting certain medical references, but also, often with the help of uh, human rights activists and lawyers, because even if they had all the documents prepared, 
and there was the uh, this mention in, in the in the state documents that uh, trans people both trans men and trans women uh, were allowed to leave the country and they were not uh, subject to uh, obligatory conscription uh, still human factor and sometimes uh, border officers wouldn't allow them to to leave um so border crossing experiences for many uh, of them um especially those who were not uh, cisgender women were described as uh, very humiliating and painful uh, some gay men who managed in the beginning to uh, get documents from human rights organizations invitation to study at the university or some uh, job offers uh, who were all substantially allowed to leave officially allowed to leave they couldn't do that trying to cross border in several places and in the end um, sneaking in or like crossing it where the uh, border officers were nicer friendlier towards them in the especially mm, tough situation was of course for for trans people one um, uh trans men uh whose uh documents also were not uh, wasn't changed yet uh was made to undress um with his mother and uh, officer being there like to check uh, the, the the body organs so all all this uh, of course was uh described in a, in as a, as a very traumatic experience which uh needs to be you know needs to be addressed further uh and then important thing is of course that uh, all my interviewees except also again a couple of exceptions were not living alone so additional circumstance would be children elderly relatives pets um sometimes friends who were in more vulnerable situation due to their health condition uh and this all also shaped their experiences because this migration was not by by, by them even if they saw it as additionally risky being LGBTQ people, uh, but still it was first of all escaping from from the military invasion, and uh, it was shaped by this by this immediate threat of death of being uh, killed of the house being destroyed rather than uh, of the dis you know because of uh, wanting to come out or uh, to to join um, uh, LGBTQ scene elsewhere. Then we have two different uh, stories or two different uh, narratives uh, that, of course, also then again are more nuanced depending on the country. But uh, for people who left uh, for countries like Germany, Austria, um, and also like Netherlands, uh, so uh, so to say, more uh, LGBTQ friendly and more liberal countries as opposed to Eastern European. And I will first start with with those that are uh, coming from sort of imaginary West or so 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 called West, and. Uh, there, of course, experiences, even though there are some shortcomings, and uh, I will be also glad to address those in the discussion, maybe. But uh, what is important is, of course, that for people who, as they said, that they never considered leaving and they didn't want to leave, new recognition of their families, and it's especially uh, important for those who came uh, with a partner and with a child. So this recognition of their family as family, uh, as a family union, what became crucial, and they name it as the most important reason why they would not want to come back to Ukraine, even if the situation improves radically, even if uh, the Russia withdraws all the forces. Uh, but uh, without recognition of uh, same-sex unions and um, adoption of children, now they say that they don't want to go back. Also, many say that uh, they would love to stay also because of children, because of the uh, education for children uh, and overall feeling of freedom, feeling of uh, being who they are. Even though I have to say that all of them are quite critical and uh, quite down to earth in the sense that they understand that situation is not perfect even in those countries. And that, of course, there is discrimination, there is racism, there is um, uh, hierarchy of citizenships uh, and so on. Uh, but also, of course, very, very practical issues. There is more financial security, support with housing, potential opportunities for integration. So people talk about uh, attending the courses, integration courses, where, among other, as you know, um, the discussion about uh, LGBTQ rights is going. So one interviewee, for example, said that he goes to uh, to a group, uh, to this integration course with people from uh, different uh, Middle Eastern countries, and that he feels okay talking about his sexuality, even though he had those, of course, certain stereotypes and fears about how it could be perceived by people from different cultures. But he says that the atmosphere there is that he feels confident saying that, oh, I have my partner and my partner is man. 
But of course, there is uh, certain language barriers, there is feeling of social exclusion, and uh, there are also some tensions, which also we could uh, discuss. I think it is an interesting and uh, important topic, uh, tensions between different kinds of uh, queer communities, migrant queer communities in different countries, including, for example, the case with Quartira that was uh, mentioned uh, by Richard, but also similarly uh, with the um, uh, Rusa LGBT, LGBT uh, in, uh, in the US. So when, when there is this further conversation about belonging, about the language, about the self-identification, uh, there are some tensions and there are some uh, new clashes that uh, deserve further attention and discussion. Now, for people who ended up in uh, Eastern European countries, experience is quite different. And, uh, and we know that Poland is one of the major host countries, uh, that many Ukrainians are there, including LGBTQ Ukrainians. And then many also actually stayed in Slovakia. And when being asked about why, you know, I have chosen those countries, uh, even though these countries are not paradise for LGBTQ people, and even local activists in Slovakia are quite open about saying like, oh, don't, don't stay here, the situation here is not good, go further, go to Germany, go to, um, to Finland or Sweden. But again, very practical reasons people talk about, and those are language, proximity of culture and lifestyle, and they say that already feeling traumatized being uh, in this foreign setting where they still need to learn the language. And it's not that easy if you have to work on some hard physical works like at the warehouse or in the bakery or the factory where many found employment. And after that, of course, uh, you know, to, to try to go to language classes is uh, quite a challenge. And they say that they, they will not they don't have resources to be able to move to a country like Germany, where they will not understand the word. And many of them also don't speak English. So uh, basically after Ukrainian and Russian, um, learning Polish and or Slovak is already a big challenge and not, not to speak about other languages. And also, so, so they say that, uh, and, and for this group of people, actually there is much higher uh, desire to go back to Ukraine and there is much higher appreciation of the life they had in Ukraine. So many say that um, they think that their life as a queer person, LGBTQ person, was much more open in Ukraine, that they felt much comfort, much more comfortable, that more things were happening, that um, now they appreciated the activism that we had, the level of advocacy, and uh, also the, um, uh, the level of activists. Uh, and uh, of this group, many say that, no, 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 we, we really want, we are just looking for, for the moment when we will be able to go back. And to start changing country together for uh, for the better. Of course, it's also not one, not one hundred percent. There are some people. There is one couple who says that they want to stay in Slovakia because they want their child to continue studying because it's very traumatic to to move child from one country to another, even though it means for them to stay closeted because Slovakia doesn't recognize uh, same sex unions. And there is a very big awareness of being unsafe. So people say uh, this is a quote that I cannot treat people here. One person said that. When I see a person on the street in Ukraine and when he approaches me and he says, asks me if you are a lesbian and I can understand from his face expression how I should react, whether he's just messing with me, whether I should make a joke, whether I should keep it very calm and try to, to escape. Well, she says in Slovakia, I, I don't understand that. I don't understand whether I should be afraid or not. Uh, and it was very shocking for them last year when there was this shooting at the um, uh, at the, next to the gay club in Bratislava. So this realization that Eastern Europe is, as they say, in certain case, in certain things or aspects, uh, even less um, LGBTQ friendly or safe for them than Ukraine uh, became an uh, eye opening for them. And finally, the, the last uh, thing that I wanted to mention is, of course, uh, the um, situation with how uh, local, uh, meaning in European, in the EU countries, organizations reacted to the situation with uh, this influx of uh, LGBTQ refugees. And I, I permitted myself to, to also uh, you know, mention here my article where I discuss it in, in more detail. But uh, main things that, uh, main criticisms that were uh, named was of course, uh, surprising lack of cooperation and coordination between organization in different countries. And uh, this lack of coordination was quite extreme as if to having no um, no Zoom calls or no correspondence or even re refusing sometimes to recommend uh, contacts to people writing to them. So there were many people saying, and by many I would say like 
third of my sampling saying that they would be writing emails to uh, LGBTQ rights NGOs and host countries and in other countries and not getting responses uh, or being like, you know, refused help. Uh, they were also mentioning you know, capital capitalization on Ukrainian cause, and this probably is the worst one when people, the organization were, was getting certain funding to help Ukrainians, but wasn't really doing almost anything. And then uh, what was also often mentioned is lack of sensitivity when there is uh, assumption that uh, refugees from Ukraine and from Russia uh, can and should be mixed without asking uh, sides and without treating with sensitivity, for example, the, the, the lack of, uh, well, well, well the, the reluctance or in principle, the, refuge, uh, the, the rejection of uh, Ukrainian people to speak Russian, um, which, you know, can be quite understandable in this context. Uh, so there is this, there is this intersection of uh, now growing Ukrainian and queer identity for many of my respondents, also going back to the cohort, that was that I was mentioning in the beginning. So those who left uh, earlier and who lived in uh, other countries already, uh, some of them also changed their political standing. And uh, like having a, some follow-up interviews with them, they have made decision to uh, kind of separate themselves from a broader Russian-speaking LGBTQ community. And uh, finally. What is important and unfortunate with these uh, NGOs and uh, LGBTQ rights NGOs is the competition for resources that exists between countries and between organizations in the countries, helping uh, queer refugees from Ukraine, from Russia, from, from other countries, that of course, unfortunately, doesn't result in a more cooperation and mutual projects, but rather in competition and silencing the possibilities and uh, being like, in, in a way, against each other. Um, and the final final thing that I want to say, just half a minute and I'm done, is that about future plans, of course. As I said, a lot of people really want to, to go back to Ukraine. However, those who said that they want to stay, several things that they are mentioning was, of course, staying for the sake of children or family members, especially those who do have uh, some health condition. Uh, the recognition of um, family status and uh, general unsafety, unsafety in Ukraine, meaning that even if Russia, when Russia withdraws uh, the uh, forces from Ukraine, they were mentioning the rests of weapons, the inability for like, uh, that it will be impossible for kids to walk in the park or elsewhere because of the mine, landmines, uh, and also general feeling of danger, potential danger, having an aggressive neighbor like Russia. I will stop here and I will be very happy to, to discuss it later. And uh, thank you very much for, for listening and for coming and joining today. Thank you so much, Marina. Oh, yes, this, I, I, have, I have questions. All that I, I think we could talk about, you, you brought up so many points here that could be discussed uh, just a little bit later on, but let me introduce with my greatest pleasure our last speaker today, uh, Masha Begatova, who is working on a doctoral thesis Queer Eastern European and Central Asian Diaspora Beyond in, uh, in parenthesis, visibility and in parenthesis, self uh, exoticization in Slavonic Cultural Studies and Gender Studies at Humboldt University, Berlin, and is holding a Rosa Luxemburg Scholarship. Masha's research interests include queer feminist and diasporic literature and activism, uh, critical migration studies, Ukrainian and diasporic queer feminist resistance, intersectional loneliness, and queer friendship. They have also published uh, a fascinating, another fascinating article uh, uh, recently in Lambda Nordica uh, called The Meth Methodology of Surgic. And I, I read it and I just want to share it with everyone. <laughs> it's open access, please. If you're interested, go check it out. Masha, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, I want uh, first to thank uh, the organizers. Uh, thank you very much, Alexandra and Maria, and uh, everyone who has um, contributed uh, to the possibility to make this uh, panel possible. Um, yeah, uh, uh, and um, I, I will just uh, start with my positionality. Uh, I'm Masha Biketova. I'm a queer person of Ukrainian origin. Uh, I live in Germany since um, 2004. And uh, regarding my positionality as a researcher, I'm uh, both an insider and outsider uh, to the group that I'm studying. On the one hand, I'm biographically part of a queer diasporic community, having migrated from Ukraine to Germany, uh, and uh, being a queer person myself. 
On the other hand, uh, my academic privileges have afforded me an analytical distance from this community. At the same time, speaking um, as a white uh, German-Ukrainian researcher of Eastern Europe and Central uh, Asian diaspora in Germany leads me uh, to a serious problem of possible generalization, um, which uh, I'm trying to solve uh, in my writing by referring uh, not to a Russophone communities, but looking for ways to include various uh, perspectives and to Center Russia, as well as critically look um, to the constructions of post-Sovietness, um, and I will come to this point um, once again later. Nevertheless, my over uh, 10 years of uh, activist and embodied experiences, um, language skills, and insider knowledge have shaped my approach uh, to the field and um, the trust that my respondents uh, have uh, shown towards me during the interviews. In my PhD thesis, uh, I center lived experiences and discourses of LGBTIQ plus migrants and refugees from uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia to Germany. Um, this is uh, believed to be the biggest migrant group in Germany. And prior to uh, the full scale Russian invasion um, into Ukraine, uh, this ethnically and culturally diverse groups from 15 different countries uh, were often generalized as the Russians by the German society, which was mostly uh, unaware of the colonial history uh, of the post-Soviet region, the ethnic and cultural differences uh, inside this uh, migrant group. Significant part of this migrant population was coming to Germany in the recent 30 years um, as uh, the so-called late repatriates and uh, quota refugees, as already uh, Richard has mentioned. Uh, these two programs uh, were installed by the German um, government to invite people with German and Jewish origins, but of course very different in terms of ethnical and cultural belonging and religion people came with these programs. These groups were often seen by scholarship as completely separate ones and uh, the commonalities of the experiences uh, were often overlooked uh, in the research. Researchers such as uh, Yanis Panagiotidis, Daria Klingenberg, uh, Alina Gromova and others have started uh, to critically use uh, such terms as post-Soviet, uh, referring to the shared post-Soviet uh, as post-colonial experiences uh, in this migrant group. But among these dia diaspora there are also asylum seekers, uh, those who have migrated as students and because of uh, work uh, or are married to uh, an EU citizen or uh, also illegalized migrants. The recent escalation of the Russian war on Ukraine has added up uh, up to one more million of um, new migrants to Germany. And among them, uh, there are undoubtedly uh, non-heterosexual and non-cisgender persons. Statistically, um, mm, we can speak uh, up to 7% of the population, but uh, uh, regarding uh, to the recent um, migration from Ukraine, uh, I, I would suppose uh, that queer persons uh, maybe um, are more uh, percentage, um, but as I'm doing qualitative studies, uh, I, I uh, will uh, stop um, speculating here. Um, among the so-called post-Soviet diaspora, um, there are people of color and persons entitled with white privilege. The post-colonial and ongoing colonial dynamics in their countries of origin are adding up to the specific post-migrant context in Germany. Before presenting my thesis, uh, I want to also uh, clarify my use of terms. Having in mind uh, two formerly uh, existed uh, exist researches uh, on uh, queer discourses and uh, lived experiences from Eastern Europe and Central uh, Asian migrants uh, in Germany, those of Richard Moll and also of uh, Ilka Borchardt. Uh, I have initially started 2018 uh, with my PhD thesis uh, to work uh, on the term uh, Russophone uh, slash post-Soviet queer diaspora. And uh, regarding uh, those two terms, I have chosen uh, back then the term post-Soviet. Um, my logic back then was not all post-Soviet migrants identify as Russophone, even if they speak Russian. Uh, and uh, there are, um, especially in the second generation, people who uh, would uh, rather speak German or um, other languages uh, or uh, would just prefer to speak Ukrainian or Georgian and uh, not uh, identify with the language Russian. Um, uh, I was already referring to the current research, uh, which is... Um, 
still using this common de denominator. Uh, and uh, what I has, have found out during my research and during um, re reading um, academic literature and speaking uh, also to various respondents, uh, that uh, the term post-Soviet has also its limitations and problems. Uh, but especially in German uh, context, I was still viewing uh, un uh, until last year uh, that it was relevant to work with this uh, common de denominator uh, instead of this simplifying Russian speaking. Um, furthermore, to mark uh, the power imbalance in which Russia and the Russian language continued to hold uh, the dominant position, uh, it was important or, or it seemed important to me uh, to talk about post-Soviet colonial dynamics also in the diaspora. When the war broke out, um, Sergei Abashin has uh, written a post on Facebook uh, where uh, he has uh, said it is an end of uh, the post-Soviet project. Uh, and uh, it is indeed a very uh, co controversial term. Um, last year, um, I was faced with the question of whether any common post-Soviet experience could be assumed, uh, while so many people are currently struggling uh, to have nothing to do uh, with, with this past, and even critical decolonial approaches started to avoid the term post-Soviet. What I perceived as contemporary uh, and current uh, relationships in my field has already proven to be historical. The time I focused um, in my research was between 2000 and 2022, but 2022 set a watershed. Many of my observations uh, and theses before um, 20, 2022 will no longer be valid uh, if uh, we would apply them uh, to the current um, migration from Ukraine, and therefore I'm very thankful for uh, Marina's research. Um, now in 2023, uh, uh, I understand that I have catched a very specific time frame uh, in my data collection between the beginning of uh, Russia-Ukraine war in 2014 and its uh, full-scale escalation in 2022. And it turns out uh, that uh, my research covers a period of in which linguistic and cultural practices were possible that seemed simultaneously political and non-political at the same time. In this period, queer diaspora has produced activist practices of solidarity and communication which have radically changed and are still changing now. Similarly challenging uh, is the discussion of the term, uh, as, as uh, the discussion of the term post-Soviet is also using the term queer or um, the abbreviation LGBTIQ+, for non-Western persons uh, who have migrated to Western Europe. In my analysis, I try to go beyond uh, the usual terms and look uh, on and uh, sometimes against the categories and not uh, with the given categories. Um, but I also have to admit that the most uh, people um, who gave me interviews um, have been relating positively to one or another well-known in the West uh, queer self-identifications. My focus uh, lies um, or has lied in my sampling, uh, especially on non-heterosexual women and trans persons, as many studies and also um, I think Marina, you have also written on this and uh, have brought up, uh, brought, brought up uh, today, uh, but also other researchers such as uh, Zoya Kashrafudinova, Nina Held, uh, and others have proven uh, how research on queer asylum seekers and uh, migrants uh, is dominated by representations uh, and focus on lived experiences of uh, gay uh, cis men. My research includes uh, an analysis of biographical interviews um, with queer migrants and refugees to Germany, uh, and uh, those were conducted between 2019 and 2022. And um, actually, the very last interview I have conducted uh, on 23rd February, February of the last year. Um, and also, I have been analyzing literature and art uh, that, uh, done by uh, queer diasporic actors. Uh, and my participant ob observations in activism, such uh, as um, local gay pride demonstrations, um, so called uh, Marzan Pride in, in, in Berlin. As I work with the colonial approach, it is essential for me to avoid treating the research communities as a mere object of study and to ensure uh, that the knowledge I produce is with and for queer migrants rather than about them or us. For this, I hold workshops and regular uh, exchange with the communities in the sense of uh, participatory research uh, where I can discuss my thoughts and claims. Um, 
This uh, approach uh, also included decentering uh, white Russian perspectives also before uh, the full-scale invasions in uh, the samplings uh, and in, in the interviews and consciously choosing to invite activists of color and of marginalized ethnicities. Furthermore, my own positionalities led me to uh, research um, a specific generation of queer migrants um, and uh, I am not sure if it is the, the correct term, but I will just say it out, uh, the last post-Soviet generation. So the queer uh, individuals uh, I interviewed were mostly born in the Soviet Union uh, and shortly uh, or shortly after its dissolution uh, and spent uh, some of their lives in the newly independent post-Soviet states and migrated to Germany as teenagers or adults. These informants possess a unique multiple perspectives. Uh, for some of them, uh, the term post-Soviet is synonymous with post-colonial or colonial. Uh, for others, uh, it was also unifying and consolidating concept in the diaspora, even though they uh, did not support Putin's imperialist uh, ambitions. In my field work observations, um, during a conflict uh, within one uh, queer Russian-speaking organization, one activist uh, exclaimed, uh, quote, how did we become what we are fighting against, um, unquote. This statement highlights the power dynamics um, that uh, this individual perceives within their LGBT organization in diaspora. Um, Following uh, Richard Moll, I, I also work with the term queer diaspora. The field of queer diaspora uh, research with Martin Manalasan and Gayatri Kopinat is a rapidly growing, uh, super interesting field, uh, which has so far focused mostly on migration uh, from the global south uh, to the global north and was uh, very strongly focused uh, also on uh, United States uh, or Canada. Uh, and queer migrations from Eastern Europe and Central Asia to uh, Western Europe are rather not so much research, uh, researched yet uh, in terms of sexuality and gender. Mm, so uh, my research hopefully uh, will contribute um, a queer feminist and intersectional uh, decolonialist approach to that field. I work uh, also in an intersectional paradigm, which means uh, that I assume that a person is never uh, only shaped by their migration experience uh, or sexuality, but uh, by a very complex interplay of uh, these two categories, but also others such as uh, age, race, um, or racification uh, experience, um, gender, ability, and class. My data included um, about uh, 23 narrative um, biographical interviews with um, LGBTIQ plus migrants and refugees uh, who have been activists or uh, non-activists. And I was also especially interested uh, of speaking with such people who were um, saying we are not lesbians, we just family, we just love each other. Um, and uh, to understand their positionality, I, I was also um, making one focus group interview with Quartira, uh, uh, mentioned above organization, and um, some expert interviews with community activists and scholars. And um, I was also looking through um, blogs and so-called gray literature, uh, web pages of initiatives and events. And uh, I was also um, involving uh, work with um, literary texts, uh, novels such as Stroga Devushka by Olga Zhuk, um, uh, Russian Jewish author, uh, and also Kentavr versus Satir uh, by uh, Andrei Ditzel. And also uh, there is uh, a compilation of short stories and poetry, uh, which I uh, was also co-editing, Nam jest što skazać, wir haben was zu sagen, which I'm also um, looking uh, in, uh, in in my analysis. And um, I, uh, I am also... Uh, working with two German-speaking um, novels, um, Außer sich, uh, written by Sasha Mariana Salzmann, and uh, Die juristische Unschärfe einer Ehe by Olga Grisnova. Um, initially, I was also intending uh, to work more with uh, German mainstream media uh, and also with German LGBTIQ uh, media, uh, such as Queer.de, El Mag, Siegessäule, and uh, to uh, work out um, nar narratives by... Um, German journalists, uh, how do they uh, represent uh, uh, the focused uh, group? Uh, but um, I think it will not take so much uh, place in my research. And as well, I, I was also doing participant observation. Um, 
Thank you, Alexandra. I see five minutes more. Um, so my uh, research question was, how do the author discourses um, on gender, sexuality, class, religion, and um, regional belonging affect the self-constructions of uh, Eastern European and Central Asian non-heteronormative and non-cisgender migrants? Um, and uh, especially, I, I was interested in um, diasporic uh, conviviality. So not on the processes of migration or reasons of migration, but rather on the discourse is how the people uh, coexist together in, in diaspora. Uh, so now I'm coming to the part where I'm going to present my central findings, which are still work in progress, um, as I'm still in, in the writing down pro uh, process. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful if you have some critique or um, would say me that, that some points uh, need further el elaboration. My starting point was to um, try to understand whether queer migrants uh, from Eastern Europe and Central Asia form a separate category of queer migrants, which is distinct from white German queers uh, and uh, with uh, sometimes different agenda or political activist trajectories from uh, queers of color of second generation in Germany. Um, and uh, this is already the first claim I'm going to do that, yes, there is a specific lived experience and aspirations and ascriptions of whiteness do play a huge role in the constructions of um, these migrant groups. My second anal uh, analytical premise was to critically examine that uh, the visibility paradigm is uh, doing um, an inter intersection on a non-normative uh, of non-normative sexualities and marginalized genders with migration experience. My claim, based on analysis of activisms and uh, non-governmental organizations in German mainstream queer media, uh, is that visibility is almost only possible through self-exoticization. In this situation, multiply marginalized queer migrants take up the role of cultural mediators and have uh, to address simultaneously multiple power relations. Uh, those of anti-migrant resentment uh, of German host society, uh, the Russian imperialism and ethno-nationalism of their own communities, and uh, of course, uh, the global homo and trans discriminations. Uh, if we summarize the existing uh, discourses on queer diaspora in Germany, um, we can see that uh, the life realities and complex narratives of um, Eastern European and Central Asian queers are hardly imaginable in those discourses. Intercultural alliances offer possibilities of homonormative inclusion, which I describe as conditional love. Um, those um, who are willing to stage themselves as victims of violence uh, or exoticize their own communities may find representation. Um, otherwise, queer migrants continue to be imagined as cis and straight and are, um, in Fatima El Tayeb's wording, impossible um, subjects. Some uh, queer migrants uh, shape um, the uh, activist practices in line with those discourses. In another part of my dissertation, I examine how um, the self-representations of queer migrants partially reflect the powerful discourses of anti-migrant sentiment and culturalization of homophobia. My claim is uh, that uh, the ambiv ambivalent uh, positionality of this group has to, uh, a lot to do firstly with the structure of uh, German post-colonial discourses and discourses on migration and racism, and secondly, with uh, the post-Soviet colonial history. I also claim that uh, between uh, 2014 and 2022, uh, a kind of third, third space in Homi Baba's sense was possible uh, in queer diaspora, where different Eastern European and Central Asian queer migrants were able to organize communities in Germany around the uh, queerness. Um, or non-normative sexuality uh, and marginalized genders, uh, and despite or rather with the political divisions and differences. Those communities were um, Russia-centric. Uh, for example, even people not from Russia were concerned uh, with uh, political homo-discrimination in Russia and uh, were speaking Russian language or dancing to Russian queer-coded music. Um, some respondents uh, report on racism and exclusions based on ethnicity, um, which uh, happened at that time in the queer communities. My next point uh, was concerning the narratives of optimism, and um, I call it thank you Germany, um, in the interviews uh, of multiply marginalized queers. Uh, and uh, I was asking my data whether uh, it only means depoliticization or other, other reasons for such discourses. 
I also tried to look especially on the category of class uh, and questions of poverty, education, and public discourses in understanding that. Uh, for some migrants, the queerness was, um, and this might be also one of my claims, uh, was rather an entry ticket uh, to Western European whiteness and uh, improvement of their social pos pos position. I also discovered narratives of queer migrant loneliness and queer friendship and solidarity at the same time. Several uh, respondents voiced um, a critique on the term community. They said, I do not believe in community, quote unquote, or uh, quote, uh, for me, community is difficult, unquote. Uh, this uh, research seeks to understand what these critiques have to do with racism, um, also sexism inside of uh, LGBT communities, also Russian imperialism, anti-Semitism, lesbophobia, and trans discrimination. I was also concerned with the question, um, are they, uh, there other narratives beyond um, the trauma narratives and beyond the dilemma of invisibility and self-exoticization in queer migration? Mm. At the same time, uh, these alternative communities enabled queer migrants to redistribute knowledge and to support each other. Besides the isolation narratives, my interviews are full of stories where queer migrants are uh, reporting about support they have received from other earlier migrant and refugee queers and also from non-queer migrants. Um, subtle and unobvious strategies of self-empowerment and collective resistance evolve in the frame of queer diasporic friendships. And I will stop here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Okay, so I am using the clap emoji here just to, <laughs> yes, to thank everyone once again for fabulous presentations. And we have just well, 17, yeah, 17 minutes left or so for the discussion. I just, so what I wanted to say, what I'm listening to you, uh, what I just, I'm just going to like the name points, right? My, just fire off some thoughts that I was like, uh, based on the notes I was making. So what I see here, if, if it is, again, uh, migrating, migrating queer people living in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia, migrating within the region and also outside of it are so diverse that it would be really any attempt at generalization would make a, well would fail essentially right essentially it would fail so uh which doesn't mean that we should stop trying to fail better right as you know, quoting the queer art the failure here but the jack helpers now we should really keep trying and, and and keep looking for new terms and new ways to represent, right, to, to speak to this diversity. And you have done, well, you have a brilliant job just now. And uh, at the same time, I also wanted to point out how important intersection and intersectional approaches to understanding queer migrations in this region. Because uh, listening to your presentations, especially to uh, Dr. Shevtsova's uh, presentation, but also to Masha Beckett's presentation, I was thinking, I was reminded of a famous uh, quote from a femi queer feminist of color classic theories, Gloria Anzaldúa, that queer people have no race or no country. And really, uh, research on queer migrations has proven yet again and again that indeed queer people do have a nationality, do have a race, do have a culture. And uh, despite, well, <laughs> yeah, uh, despite the best maybe utopian uh, utopian vision that queerness can somehow unite, right? Unite people uh, otherwise uh, divided. Uh, it doesn't really happen as easily. But so issues or questions of tensions within queer diasporic and migrant communities are important. And so are the issues of solidarity. And again, whether, whether uh, it is possible to overcome these tensions. Uh, so if you, uh, so that would be my first question to all of you, if you could speak a little bit more about tensions and solidarity efforts uh, that you have observed, uh, if there's anything that is worth mentioning uh, or discussing further. Uh, my second question to you would be, uh, and feel free to ignore my questions because we don't have much time well, and I would also love to hear from the audience. But my second question would be to, uh, if, you, if you could share, what you what whether you had any unexpected discoveries as you uh, as you conducted your research, whether there was something that you didn't expect to find but found out, and uh, if you could talk about that a little bit, whether what was the most challenging 
uh, part of conducting research with queer mig migrations, migrants uh, in Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, what is next for you? Uh, what do you think uh, should be, yeah, should, uh, what, what's, what scholars and activists and maybe even policymakers should be paying attention to next when it comes to uh, the subject? And finally, and finally, also since we are, well, talking about people, right, new people on the ground and their lived experiences and the possible, well, possible hardships that may, they may, uh, well, they may face as multiply marginalized uh, queer migrants. If you could talk about, if you could, if you have any suggestions, any ideas, so again, policy wise, I'm yeah, being empirical here, always interested in what can be done. Uh, not that again, it always works out, but if you have any uh, suggestions on what should be done, what what needs of the people you have worked with uh, should be, uh, well, again, we should all be paying attention to as a community of activists, scholars, policy makers, possibly. Uh, so those are my uh, my thoughts here. Uh, so if uh, so, I would like to hear from yeah. If you if each of you could really uh, choose <laughs> choose any of these points to very briefly, like for a minute uh, or so, uh, speak about that would be wonderful. And then we'll take questions from the audience. Thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, I might start off then. Um, so uh, obviously I'm not going to answer all of them, but we'll be here for another uh, two or three hours. Um, uh, but um, I, as you sort of, uh, when you introduced me, you said I was particularly interested in the relationship between identity and power um, and how identities change quite quickly. Um, and uh, as uh, sort of Masha and Marina have been speaking a lot about the sort of the current situation and the, the sort of the the, the need to sort of de-center Russia and what to call Russian speakers in the post-Soviet. This was this I found to be much less of an issue in 2011 for, for obvious reasons. And actually they emphasized the commonality of having grown up in the Soviet Union. Um, they said there were only sort of two, there were only two TV channels. We all watched the same TV. Uh, we all sang the same songs in kindergarten. Um, therefore, you know, this is what sort of brought us us together. Um, uh, you know, the, the Ukrainians I spoke to at the time said, you know, when we were growing up, we didn't notice a big difference between sort of Russia and Ukraine, you know, for Ukraine was your sort of mother tongue. Uh, and obviously that is what is sort of um, so different uh, nowadays. Um, so, so that was sort of just one sort of point about how um, sort of self-perception or self-description sort of changes uh, so differently as a result of sort of external factors. Um, so I'll, I'll move on to Marina and Masha now. Thank you. Yes, uh, Alexandra, thank you so much for, um, for raising all those points and such a pity that we only have a little time. So I wanted to just address one thing of soli about solidarity that, uh, that you raised. And I wanted to say that this is probably something that is relevant not only for, for queer diaspora or queer refugees, but also for academic solidarity or feminist solidarity, um, much has been talked about. I think what we've been observing uh, since 2014, and especially now, and all, all those tensions growing and then you know culminating and uh, with the beginning of a large scale invasion was the, um, the change of the grievances that uh, people from Ukraine and Russia had and um, I think the tension starts, well, apart from the, the situation when the uh, opposite side would be supporting Putin's regime, then of course it's out of discussion. But I think what, what is uh, often overlooked by Western academia or Western activists or NGOs is this, this moment of clash when um, there is this assumption that we are having the same grievances uh, as both sides and that we have the same problem. And this is not not how it is perceived by by people who are uh, who are the left Ukraine or why in Ukraine now, and basically this is where where the conflict starts because um, once there is acknowledgement that no the problem is not the same or the grievances are not the same, then it's not a matter of language anymore. It's not a not a matter of you know which passport you are having. But once it is like, no, we are in the same boat, we should be doing this together, or now all the hope is on Ukrainians, uh, then, then it, it does sound kind of insulting. And this is where uh, I, it came up in interviews, but also in my own experience at the conferences and in some discussions, that's where, where it all starts, because it, it kind of, uh, you know, brings us back together to the, the same people, we are same people narrative, even, you know, 
So uh, I'm not in, even saying that it's necessarily colonial or decolonial, post-colonial, but rather that that's basically into, again, again, taking away the agency and subjectivity from Ukrainian people as they self-identify or as we self-identify ourselves. Um, so yeah, if I only could make one point, this would be this. That is so. That is so important, and I'm, I'm. I'm glad you. I'm glad this is the point you chose to make, and I absolutely agree. Thank you so much, Dr. Shitsova. Thank you, Dr. Shitsova. Alexandra, we couldn't hear the last words from you. Oh, I was just thanking Marina. <laughs> yeah, I might continue. Uh, um, and I would uh, refer to the question uh, also uh, how uh, the full-scale invasion has affected my research. Uh, and uh, I decided to stop uh, to gather my data uh, because uh, the data was so different uh, of also what we have seen today uh, from Marina and uh, also uh, um, re recently I have been asked Asked somebody of Ukrainian origin to uh, give talks or to to uh, present something uh, on uh, recent uh, migration, and uh, I had no uh, possibility to gather a complete round of twenty more uh, interviews. Uh, but I was observing um, discourses uh, in in media and in uh, representations of uh, organizations and. and uh, what I have uh, seen that, um, and also through community ob observation, uh, that um, indeed during the last year, uh, completely new organizations and initiatives led by Ukrainian queers have evolved in Germany. Uh, and for example, uh, there was for the first time in the mainstream gay parade uh, car of uh, Ukrainian queers. Uh, um, visible or um, now um, there were certain cooperations also between Quartira and people coming from Ukraine and uh, there was uh, also a position uh, to cancel in Ukrainian uh, in Berlin until recently but uh, now uh, there are attempts to establish a new organization uh, in Berlin only led by Ukrainian non cis heteronormative people um, and of course, uh, there were uh, there were uh, several parties um, or um, initiatives or also demonstrations during the last year, uh, which were um, yeah um, advertised in Ukrainian, which were referring to specific Ukrainianness uh, and also const constructing. Uh, um, uh, and uh, one example, uh, I have no uh, slide, uh, but uh, there was a techno party uh, last summer in Berlin, uh, which um, was uh, referring to uh, summer solstice uh, in, in, in um, Ukrainian. And uh, um, as I uh, have been uh, talking about this um it, it, it was a queer party and it was uh, for Ukrainians, uh, from Ukrainians. And as I was talking about this uh, to my um, Slav Slavonic faculty uh, members, uh, they have uh, reacted in a very interesting way because in Germany, um, re reference uh, to uh, those um, uh, pagan traditions is, is very much... Um, yeah, um, poisoned by the German history. So uh, I think uh, if we are uh, thinking of both contexts, uh, the post-colonial context uh, of uh, uh, Eastern Europe uh, and uh, the um, German history uh, in uh, simultaneous uh, overlapping, um, I think uh, we can come to very interesting results. And uh, I, I would also like to address um, the situation of trans people, uh, because I think this is, uh, when, when we are talking about LGBTIQ+, plus, uh, this is the least researched uh, group, and also the situa situation of intersex people. And I think uh, if, if we are thinking of further research, uh, th those groups uh, have to become uh, also with uh, self-identified researchers and scholars uh, more uh, visibility and uh, uh, that we not just put uh, LGBTIQ plus uh, and, and just research situations of queer women, cis women and uh, cis men. Yeah, mm, I might finish by this.
Thank you so much, Masha. Uh, okay, so uh, dear audience members, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free uh, to unmute yourself and ask uh, them, or maybe use the raise uh, hand feature if you'd like to be called on. We have four minutes left, just plenty of time for a, for a question and an answer. Also, the dear panelists, if you have questions to each other. Oh, Victoria, Vic? Yeah, I can. <laughs> um, Masha, you spoke about how the terms queer and LGBT can be problematic. Are there any other terms you came across or have thought of that might be more applicable to migrants from Central Asia and Eastern Europe? Thank you so much for the question. Uh, I uh, have... Um, encountered, uh, for, for example, different spellings of queer, and I, uh, I have just, uh, I will put it in the chat, uh, something like this, uh, queer, uh, or uh, I, I think uh, the question is not to find an alternative term, because uh, there are uh, very many people using uh, already those internationally uh, um, acknowledged terms, but uh, to look carefully also for uh, those perspectives where people uh, refuse uh, to, to use or out of uh, various reasons uh, and uh, um, for example uh, reappropriate um, um, pejorative uh, words such as um, uh, or whatever uh, in, in a, an affirmative uh, way uh, and or uh, seek for, for, for alternatives uh, but uh, my suggestion was not to, to stop using queer or LGBT IQ uh, but to to look uh, carefully for each case uh, what how people are uh, talking about themselves thank you for the question Vic and thank you much for a great answer Right. So, any more questions? And yes, dear panelists, if you have questions to each other's uh, presentations, feel free. Oh, okay. We have a question from Dulak. Please, uh, if you are comfortable, unmute yourself. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you, panelists, for the um, wonderful presentations. And my uh, question probably will be for Masha Bikitova as well. Um, and it is actually uh, concerning the perhaps the methodology of decentering Russia. And my questions there would be sort of like. When we do decenter Russia, where does the center shift? If there is center left after that, or are we looking towards like sort of like a multipolar, multifocal situation here? And and what methodologically and conceptually should we change as we are abandoning post-Soviet as well as a as a conceptual framework? Thank you. Thank you, Dolat, for this uh, wonderful question. Uh, I am uh, also myself uh, seeking for, for solutions. Uh, and um, my approach was until recently to uh, decenter Russia in, in a way, um, in, in that way that I uh, acknowledge that Russia has had a huge impact of, of colonial, imperial. Uh, uh, violence on uh, different uh, post-Soviet uh, regions, and um, in in uh, dealing with the, this violence, uh, we uh, and acknowledging uh, the struggles and and the the suffering of of different peoples, uh, we um, of course come back to to those hegemons and and to to criticizing them, and uh, all, also maybe. Um, it was completely false uh, assumption uh, of mine to to work with uh, some commonality, and uh, maybe I, I should have started just to work uh, with Ukrainian queer migrants or uh, um, Belarusian. But um, my experience was also that. Um, some people who have migrated uh, from Ukraine and uh, given um, interviews to me uh, have had multiple heritage heritages uh, and uh, were not clearly identifying as uh, white Ukrainians, but have had, uh, for example, uh, Jewish uh, and uh, Armenian uh, 
heritages and uh, I think it, it refers to, to the complexity of post-Soviet history and uh, um, until uh, yeah we, we are in this situation we, we have to, to deal with those complexities uh, and uh, to, to look carefully in each case so for, for, for me it, it was the solution maybe um, I have to think further um, uh, how to address your question thank you Thank you, Masha. Thank you a lot. Uh, well, so, uh, dear everyone, we are out of time. Unfortunately, <laughs> I wish I could stay here with you for another couple of hours, right? Just chatting about, uh, well, all things queer migration and beyond. Uh, but sadly, <laughs> sadly, that would be another utopian idea. Um, so thank you, everyone, again, for joining us today. Thank you, dear panelists. Uh, Dr. Mo, Dr. Shevtsova, Maria, uh, Maria Begatova, Masha, uh, Masha Fokina, who really helped, well, facilitated, and facilitated this whole thing. Without you, Masha, we would not have uh, been able to meet online and uh, just uh, have this whole panel go so, go so smoothly. Uh, same goes to Lisa Bidwell, <laughs> yes. Uh, and thank you again, dear audience members, for joining us. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, Feel free to reach out well to me. Uh, for example, if anybody has any ideas like research ideas, collaboration plans, projects, uh, thoughts, uh, you're welcome to uh, stay in touch and continue these conversations. And I think we should stop recording right now and that ends the formal part. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>